Hello, biological anthropology students. Uh, today's lecture is for Tuesday, the 24th. So on this day, what we're going to be talking about is how species forms and more specifically, what a species is. In other words, what happens um, after changes in individuals uh, take place through the process of mutation and then sexual reproduction? How do those changes sort of propagate themselves throughout the system, right? You know, one way to think about evolution um, is the shift or changes of allele frequency in a population through time. In other words, new genes are constantly entering through individuals. And through competition through individuals, you end up with differential reproductive success. And those things begin to spread out, shifting and changing species. Well, what sort of patterns do we actually see? That's what we're talking about today. Now, the PowerPoint uh, lecture that's, that accompanies this is called the Formation uh, uh, of a species, or otherwise the forces of evolution. You'll see that below this video. So have a look at that. It should parallel what I'm talking about. And also um, in your textbook, the evolution text, um, there's a chapter in there um, and it's in pages 467 through 483, right? So um, for that's the reference section to this lecture in the evolution text, again, page 467 through 483. All right, let's go for it, all right? So, you know, when we're talking about a species, um, we've got to figure out first, um, you know, uh, I, I think uh, how species sort of change. And we'll get to what a species is later, right? So you've got something, some form like human beings or any other species which you see out there today. Well, what we see is one form. Now, there's three basic types. One thing I love about evolutionary biology, things come in pairs or threes, right? Here we go. Here's a three, right? One's called directional selection, okay? So in other words, there's some pressure that just keeps pushing something into one sort of direction, right? Eventually, that's going to have to stop, but we have you can see it moving. Now, um, how about this? Let's think about bears. So directional selection is obviously in place. So if you went to somewhere uh, like on mainland China, uh, where it's a very temperate environment, what you're going to see are like panda bears. They're small. Or even the California sort of black bear is small. But what happens when you start getting into Washington State, and then you start moving through Canada and Alaska, all of a sudden you see the brown bears, right? You see grizzly bears, they're larger. And then finally, when you get to really cold extremes, cold temperature extremes, you see something like polar bears, right? Which have large, right? They're rotund, big to preserve all that heat, you know, blubber and fat. That's directional selection, right? Okay. Now, the next type of selection in which we're, where we're gonna talk about um, is st called stabilizing selection. Now, there's a slide in there which I've used birth weight to actually demonstrate this right so um and stabilizing selection uh, you know directional selection will work for a while it's going off to one direction but it, it has to stop and stabilize at some point right there's some optimum sort of medium well uh the slide i have shows actual birth weight so you can see the figures for males and females there's this average tendency in society right because mothers you know you can only be so big to get the child out and plus if your babies are too large to begin with it's too hard for females to actually survive in a natural environment. So there has to be some sort of optimum range, yes? So that's stabilizing selection. But of course, you know, humans have thrown that stabilizing selection off, you know, through the practice of rescuing preemie babies, those are too small, and also uh, through C-sections for babies which are too large, right? And you can see the trends in the society right now, we're having larger and larger babies and smaller and smaller babies. And of course, there's gonna be a fallout from that too if we run out of medical technology, right? Now. There is sort of a uh, third uh, type of, of selection, and this is called disruptive selection. All right. So um, if we've seen uh, the film, What Darwin Never Knew, um, there's, a, there's a section that talks about switch genes, right? And they talk about the lake stickleback. Well, there's something you guys don't know about the lake stickleback. Okay, there's actually two species in there. Now there's a slide. When you look on the slideshow, it says disruptive selection. You're gonna see photographs of the lake stickleback and there are actually two varieties of these things, right? There's this um, sort of a benthic, this bottom dwelling uh, a lake uh, species, which is number A in the chart in this uh, in the slide there. And then there's one that lives in the very top zones of the lakes, right, B. And they're completely different environments. I mean, the food resources at the top of the lake are different from the bottom. Like that huge A fish has to go around and scurry looking for nymphs, insect nymphs, and it has to like overturn stones and little pebbles. So he has to have a big body. Now with B, it's different. He has to have a lot of speed because he has to hit the flies and take them from the top. Now, the thing about it is we only see two forms like this because there's been disruptive selection. That means 
in the middle of the lake, there's no food, there's no ecosystem. So if a fisherman, you know that, you either fish at the very top or the very bottom. So that disrupts any speciation potential, like a gradation. So we just see two discrete different forms. In nature, that's what we see. Directional selection, stabilizing selection, and disruptive selection. That's about the three ingredients that we have, or blends of both, right? For, for a while, you're gonna say we see uh, directional selection and it may stabilize. And there may be some agent, you know, disruption in the ecosystem, which causes disruptive selection, and we get two distinct forms more. This is taking place in the human line, too, which we're going to see. So we need to get these kind of basic sort of concepts down. All right. Now, one of the other things we need to talk about, too, are what is a species um, before we get into anything else. Okay. So a species is simply this. Um, if you've got two organisms that can reproduce and their offspring are reproductively fertile, you're generally in the same species. That's what I mean by this though. Now, for it to be a true species, that means this, that you must be able to breed in a natural environment. No pressure on you, nothing unusual. You just come together naturally and breed, okay? All right. Now, there's a different sort of concept here too. We gotta talk about subspecies. Subspecies has everything in common with the species, right? I mean, you're gonna produce the offspring, which are reproductively fertile, and they go on to have offspring. But in a subspecies, there's some behavioral thing. They just don't normally come together for sexual contact. Uh, in fact, to, to, to get subspecies to come together has to be in a natural sort of contact, like putting them in a zoo or something odd like that. That's sort of the, the first level of divergence, all right, away when we're talking about a branching, okay? Now, we can see species begin to become non-species as they may be able to come together and reproduce uh, through sexual contact, but their offsprings are infertile. Now, think about a donkey and a horse. You know, when they when they mate, um, there's a reproductive potential to produce a mule, which is sterile. They can't reproduce. So they're past the species point. They're not the same species anymore, but they still have a relatively close genetic connection. Now, of course, in time, those two species will begin to diverge enough to where if there's any sexual contact between them, they eventually will not produce anything viable, right? Nothing, no organism will come out. In fact, they'll be miscarriaging. Um, and then as, as things begin to diverge further, finally incompatibility between sperm and the egg, right? And then they're well on their road to complete and total divergence. Okay, all right. So now that we know what a species is, um, let's turn our minds back, or, or our thoughts back to how evolution actually works again. All right, so, you know, when species go out and they're uh, they're changing populations, right? It means another in, an individual trait enters the population and begins to slowly change by moving that successful trait around. Um, the key word is moving that successful trait around, and that means as it begins to move widely throughout a society, a, 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 an area, right, a, a society of animals or whatever you want to call them, right, a group of animals, um, we call it gene flow. The genes sort of flow right between populations, right? And it can happen through migration and, and other things. We can see that even human populations, their traits begin to move and flow, okay? Now, thing about it is too, is that um, genes will always flow if populations are kept together and populations will always change because we're always going to get what we call genetic drift. There's always just going to be mutations happening. So drift is always going to be continuing, right? So when we think about a, a, a species, they're never stable no matter what, okay? But at the same time, um, we also have to get different species. And that's what we got to think about. How does that actually occur? Now, when we look at the uh, slideshow I put up there again, right, the forces of evolution, um, we're talking about three different ways. Again, I love the same code. It comes in three different ways of how speciation actually happens, okay? So um, the one way in which it happens is called allopatric speciation, okay? Now, when we talk about allopatric speciation, we're talking about some a true like genetic uh, barrier comes into place, right? A barrier such as a mountain range or a river um, are, are, are great geographical barriers, but there's other geographical barriers too we didn't awfully think about. Um, how about this? Did you guys nice know that you have two species of lice on you? Of course, I don't because I bathe and I'm clean and everything, but you guys do, some of you do, I'm sorry you do, but you know, you have head lice and also pubic lice. Um, they are closely related genetically, um, but they're two different species. Um, they used to be one different species in humans about three billion years ago. And that because there was not a geographical barrier that kept them isolated. 
and that geographical barrier is hair, right? So throughout the midsection, most of us that experience this, most of us are, 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 are hairless. So it's created a geographical barrier and it allowed the speciation of two, uh, two different forms of lice, right? One feeding on the, you know, the dead skin up here in some of the oils and down there in the pubic re region, some of the, uh, the products, the seeping products, uh, you know, of, of excretion, right? So their digestive systems have changed enough and behaviorally, they're two different species, true? And, and that would be allopatric speciation. There is definitely a, uh, a, a barrier between them. So we have to be careful about when we talk about barriers between large and small, all right? Now, the next type of, of speciation um, we call parapatric, okay? So in parapatric sort of speciation, um, what happens is, is that you may not have a huge geographical barrier, right, per se. So imagine this, say like we're living in a country like the United States, but imagine it being flat, close to the coast, full of nothing but perfect grassland grasslands that every single cow in the world would love, right? Now, here's the thing. It's a big country. So the difference between Florida and Washington State is a long way. So if it were all full of one species of cow, right, and there was no seeming geographical distribution, it's the sheer size, the distance between populations that would allow them to become different species. In other words, some change in some cow in southern Florida, right, it would take so long for that gene to move over to Washington that the populations would still be drifting apart in the meantime. So that's parapatric speciation when we actually have distance. All right. Now, the third type of speciation, third type, is called sympatric, sympatric speciation. Right? That's a little more tricky. Um, you can have a speciation event right in a local environment. Right. So suppose this, you know, you're in the Sierra Mountains and you see nothing but you know, pine trees and you know, these pine trees and this one bird that specialized to eat these pine trees. And then someday some tree sprouts up in the middle of these pine trees as an oak tree. Well, that just established a different ecosystem within the current ecosystem with a local geographic environment. So certain members of birds that once ate in those pine trees only now get mutations that allow them to get into the oak tree and then they can found a different species over time is they split right so anything that entails a new ecosystem with an established one and a local geographic you know, range is a sympatric speciation event right so between allopatric parapatric and sympatric you can pretty much chart the flow of, of how humans have also um, evolved, and we'll be looking at those events too. So get those terms, all right? Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is going to be in a different video, and I'm going to post that in just a moment. So I want you to study these terms, and then we're going to get into some more technical terms about the how species, the, the proper terminology of how species split and change through time. But for the meantime, do some of those readings, have a look at at least halfway through the slideshow what I've talked about, and I'll get back with you in a little bit.